So, welcome back, everybody. We have a, uh, I guess, at least a few announcements about homework. So maybe I'll let. Uh... All right, hey guys. Um, so I'm sure you've been diligently working away on the GPU particle simulation, but for those of you that feel like you need a little bit extra time, we're not. We're going to extend it until next week. So I think uh, we're going to have it due at midnight on next Tuesday. But you know. Probably won't look at it until spring break weekend. So, you know, try to get it in earlier. Maybe I will decide to look at things early, uh, before spring break. But if not, you have a little bit extra time. We're also going to put up the next homework assignment, the NAPS, the knapsack problem online. So that's going to be due, I think, on the fourth, right after spring break. So, you might want to get started on that one too. And. Um, did we send email to everybody so that everybody gets the word of the delay? We will, we will send out an email, okay. too, for everyone. Okay. Awesome. Well, that's about it. And uh, speaking of spring break and things over that, it would be great if I could, and I sent you an email about this, could get a one-page draft of what your class project might be so we could have some feedback and interaction and, and guidance on how that would work. Or if you just want to ask questions about uh, what would be a good project, I'm certainly happy to have that conversation, too. So. Today, we're going to switch topics to yet another motif of the 13, and we're going to go to the hierarchical n-body problem. And so the this is going to take more than one lecture, and the nature of it is it's going to take a while just to explain why the algorithm works in the first place, and then I'll get to the parallelization, which has its own story as well. But here in one slide is a big idea, I hope. So I rebooted my machine this morning so it would go nice and fast, but it's still taking its good old time. Okay. Voila. Okay. So I'm interested in talking about problems where the answer at every point depends on the answer at a bunch of other points. And the canonical thing is gravity or electrostatics where you have an inverse square law which connects everybody to everybody. But it comes up all over the place. It comes up in solutions of any elliptic partial differential equations, which include electrostatics and gravity as classical special cases. But you can write down any equation where that's true. And there are a bunch of other examples where there's no differential equations where it comes up as well. So graph partitioning is another example. And so the obvious algorithms for these things seem to require every particle interacting with every other particle. And that seems to be n squared work in communication. But a lot of these problems have the special property that the farther away the particles are, the simpler they get. They, because either because the interaction gets smaller, inverse square law, or it gets smoother for some reason. I'll give an example of that. Or in some sense, it gets simpler. And so the point is, if there are a bunch of particles far away, we can compress them by taking advantage of whatever that mathematical structure is that's making them simpler. And that compression will let us do two big things. It's going to make the arithmetic complexity going down. And in fact, it's going to drop all the way from n squared to n log n, or n, if we use this idea recursively. And, and you're not, we're not going to do better than n. And of course, that means we're going to communicate a lot less as well. And so the, the um, two examples that I'm going to tell you about today and next time are going to be the Barnes-Hutt algorithm, which is the first algorithm people figure this out for, for the gravitational case. And then the more general fast multipole method, which generalizes to lots of things besides gravity. And in a later lecture, I'll show you when I talk about the structured grid motif, the same idea is going to come up again when I talk about multigrid for solving Laplace's equation. And we've already seen this idea when we did multi-level graph partitioning. But so today, I'm going to just talk about narrow down on, on gravity or electrostatics, but we'll see it's much more general than that. And so here's the outline. So I'm going to give you the obvious algorithm, you know, the n squared algorithm, and just remind ourselves what the costs are. And then um, I will talk about how to reduce the number of particles in the sums that we have to do. And we're not going to get the exact answer when we go to, to n from n squared to n log n. We're going to have to settle for an approximation. And the first algorithm that was discovered will get you like a couple of decimal digits. But if you do Barnes-Hutt, you'll have to, you know, you can get more. Maybe you'll have to settle for 16 digits, but that's good enough for most purposes, okay? But it's still an approximation. Then I'll go down to the details of the algorithms once, once we understand sort of the math of how you approximate things that are far away. So I'll tell you about the, da the data structures. Quad trees and oct trees, we've seen them before. They're going to come up here again. Then I'll tell you about Barnes-Hutt. Then I'll do fast multipole. I may or may not get to the end of that today. And I will certainly have to wait until next time to tell you about all the clever ways people have had for paralyzing Barnes-Hutt and fast multipole and their generalizations. 
So now let me just state the mathematical problem, in particular for gravity, and then I can tell you how we're going to get, do the mathematical approximations that are going to get us down to n log n. So here is the uh, toy code, which is, should be pretty familiar to us now, where every particle interacts with every other particle. So I'm going to have, I'm going to have a time step. I'm going to keep, start from time t equals zero, go up to the final time. Uh, and for each particle, I'm going to compute the force, f sub i on particle i. And then I will take each particle and move it a little bit under some standard law, like f equals ma, and then compute interesting properties of the global system, energy, whatever it is I care about, and keep going. And as I said in, in, in an earlier lecture, the force typically is a sum of three components. The external force, the nearest neighbors, and then the, the interesting thing I'm going to concentrate on in this lecture, which is where everybody depends on everybody. And the external force is the easy part. You simply know that, you know, depending on your position, say, there's some extra external force that's pushing on you that's embarrassingly parallel costs order n. Like in, you know, the, if you're a fish in an ocean and there's external current, that's all there is to it. Nearest neighbor, that was your homework assignment where it, you're only interacting with particles that are within a small distance of you, bouncing balls, van der Waals forces. That also can get down to order n if you come up with a clever algorithm for your homework assignment. And then the one I'm going to concentrate on today is where everybody depends on everybody. So here's some notation. So the force on particle i, f sub i, is the sum over all the other particles k of the force on i due to particle k. And so now I just need a formula for that two-particle force, and I'm going to concentrate on the two-dimensional case to make the math easy, but everything I say generalizes to three dimensions. So here's the inverse square law in three dimensions. V is a vector pointing from particle i to particle k, and you divide by its norm cubed, and that's the overall a one over the norm squared, and there's what it is in two dimensions. The force is proportional to just one over the norm of the vector, of the distance between them. And so this is, so I'm going to, you know, everything I say applies to both of these. I'm going to do the math for this one. And then at the end, I'll say it applies to anything that sort of gets simpler as you get farther away. And in fact, you don't have to do the math at all. There are algorithms that will figure it out for you and, and just come up with the right approximations. And uh, just to draw this picture one more time to say where we are in the course, I'm doing that particular motif. So what applications are there besides, you know, electrostatics and, well, besides gravity and so forth? Um, so, actually, let me give you some of the uh, uh, benchmarks that were set, some of the you know, uh, world speed records that people have been have set doing this. So, this is the first time people came up with this algorithm, and this was uh, Barnes Hutt, and it won a uh, Gordon Bell Prize in 1992, which is given at supercomputing every year for the sort of the fastest clever algorithm. And I'll give you a more recent uh, prize in just a moment. This is the first prize they won. And so, this was 17 million particles, 600 time steps on a whopping 512 processors, which was a big computer back in 1992, and it took 24 hours of elapsed time. And with all these 500 processors, they get up to five gigaflops, which of course your laptop does today, but this is, you know, 1992. And again, their, their goal was only 1% accuracy. But so how do you measure the speed up? If they had used, used the n squared algorithm on these 17 million particles, it would have taken 18 years to run this simulation. So this is clearly would not have been a feasible simulation. Does 1% accuracy mean you're in 1% of the right it, answer? The so, right? So, 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 just, so in the, uh, that's a good question. In your homework assignment where you're doing bouncing balls, you may have noticed already that if you compute the bounce in just a slightly different way, the particles could bounce at a different angle, and after a few time steps, they're in completely different positions. So, so what is the right answer? That is a good question. And so all that this particular 1% guarantees is that each step, the force in each particle was good to about 1%. I'll, I'll define exactly how I measure that later. And maybe that's good enough if you want to know roughly where all the stars are in a certain number of years. It may not be good enough for other applications, which is why you know, the later algorithms were invented. So this, this algorithm, was in, which I'll start with, the Barnes-Hutt algorithm, gives you about 1% accuracy on the forces. And if you want more, well, then we have to move up to a different kind of algorithm. So this one, the next uh, Gordon Bell Prize, that was uh, 2009. And this was a cluster of 256 GPUs doing about just as many particles as they did back then. And their goal was to uh, actually, they're, they're there's different Gordon Bell Prizes. This one was just going as fast and being as clever as possible. This one is a particular metric, which is dollars per gigaflop. Right, so what is the cheapest kind of high-performance computing you can get, uh, assuming that you get you know, enough gigaflops? 
And so these people got 20 teraflops, which is well above the threshold for doing the simulation. And they built it out of you know, off-the-shelf commercial parts, and it was a very, very cheap simulation. But they, they managed to do this in a, in a short period of time. So here's, those are two applications, which got a lot of recognition. But uh, so where, did, what, where else does it come up? So molecular dynamics is a pretty common simulation. In that case, it's the electrostatic forces between particles and a molecule. You want to move it forward. Uh, plasma simulation, if you're an astrophysicist, that was a, that's a common thing. Uh, the colleagues in uh, Corey Hall are interested in lithography, where you aim an electron beam and try to uh, you know, carve out a chip so that it, it looks the way you want it to. It, it, they use it there. And one I just learned about earlier this week from one of our GSIs is at Pixar, they like to simulate hair of, of, uh, of, uh, of animated characters. And they use an end body code to, uh, with little forces between all the hairs so it looks good. So that's going to be an interesting application to try in the future. OK. And you can probably come up with your own. So now, let me tell you the basic I mathematical idea for how you take you know, a, a sum that looks like it has n particles in it and make it arbitrarily shorter. And so let's suppose you want to compute the force in the Earth from everything else in the universe. So you walk out at night, and you look up in the sky, and you see about a billion little white dots. And you say, my goodness, that's a very long sum I have to compute to compute the force in the Earth. And then you realize that one of those little white dots is really the Andromeda galaxy. And it has another little billion white dots inside of it. And you say, oh, this is, problem has just gotten harder. But your first impression was correct. It's perfectly fine to think of the Andromeda galaxy as a single white dot with a, you know, with a located at the center of mass at the end of the Andromeda galaxy, and whose mass is the sum of all the stars and stuff inside the Andromeda galaxy. And conversely, if you're in the Andromeda galaxy, the Milky Way looks like a little white dot, and that's a perfectly good approximation. And now, if you're in the, uh, this, the, the Milky Way, and you want to know the force on the Earth, and you go off and you look at the solar system where the planet Vulcan is located, and you say, do I have to do that too? Well, no, you just sum up, you have one dot for the solar system that contains Vulcan. And for Vulcan's sake, you have one dot in the solar system that contains Earth, so the whole idea applies recursively. And that's what our data structure is going to do. It's going to apply this idea that particles that are close together get replaced by their center of mass, located, located, you know, total mass located at their center of mass, and we're just going to do this recursively with quad trees. And of course, the idea is not new, right? So the center of mass of the Earth and the falling apple, it was sort of a similar idea a long time ago. But, we're, but the recursion is maybe what's new. So, um, so anyway, so here, here is the, uh, the picture of Vulcan and, and the Earth again that I, that I referred to earlier. And so what is the criterion that we're going to use to decide whether a bunch of particles can be replaced by their center of mass? And so what I'm going to do is, is take the, part, the, the Earth where I want to evaluate the force. I'm going to take a box in my quad tree that's very far away and look at all the particles inside it and say, can I replace you? So what simple metric am I going to use for that? I'm going to measure the distance from the Earth to the center of gravity of all the particles in the box, call that R. The size of the box, that'll be capital D. And I'm going to look at the ratio D divided by R. And if that's small enough, if this box is very small compared to the distance, then I'll say it's good enough. So it's a nice, cheap thing to compute. And so inside my algorithm, my criterion is going to be if D divided by R is less than some threshold that the user gives me, um, to de determine the accuracy, then I will do this replacement of this box by its center of mass. Okay? So that is sort of the high level of what the algorithm is going to do. And now I have to get in the details. And I'll have to go through the math of why that works a little bit, a little bit more. Okay, so let me do, remind you about quad trees and octrees. And I'll, I will uh, draw them both first, and then to keep it simple, I'll go back to the two-dimensional case. And so this is a data structure that we're going to use to divide up the plane into all the boxes where the particles live. And uh, so we've seen this picture before, and here it's color-coded. So the, the box at the top, which contains everybody, is color-coded black, black edges and a black dot. And each box has four children corresponding to the four corners. So the blue boxes here correspond to these four blue dots. They're subdivided into four red squares, four red dots, and finally the light blue squares at the bottom. And so we've seen this data structure before. This, you, we would need everybody down here if the particles were distributed uniformly. In general, they won't be. And here is the octree, similar idea. I have three-dimensional space. I'm only going to draw two levels here. The black dot is the big cube, and the eight blue dots are the eight subcubes of half the size. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do is all, of, all the algorithms begin by get, taking a list of the particles and constructing a tree to hold them all. And they're going to do that in a recursive fashion. And it's an interesting question is, you know, how do you build that if it's badly load balanced in the first place? So I'll, I'll talk about that later. But let's just assume we can build the tree first. And, and so that means that, uh, you know, some of the tr no nodes will be more uh, finely subdivided than others, depending on the concentration of the particles. And so I will only uh, divide up the space where the particles are located. And so here is a typical picture of that situation. So uh, there, the big black square contains everybody. That's the root. Then each of the four blue squares does contain at least one particle. So I do have four children there. And now how have I numbered these just to do it? It's sort of in uh, counterclockwise order starting in, that, in the southwest corner. So that, these four dots correspond to that box, that box, that box, and that box. Just This is how I drew the picture. So these guys are done. They only have one particle each. This guy has three children, three red boxes with something in it. So I get three children there. This one also has three children. And finally, the only ones that get subdivided down deeply enough are these brown ones at the bottom, each one of which has three. Now, of course, it's going to be, I'm not going to go all the way down to one particle per box. I'm going to stop when there's some small constant number of particles per box. How do I choose that? That's going to be one of those auto-tuning parameters. And uh, if you're on a GPU, it turns out I'm going to have many more particles per box at the bottom of the, of the tree than I do if I'm on a CPU, because the GPUs are so good at the n-squared algorithm. So that's one of those tuning parameters. So uh, yeah, so I'm, this repeats it. So I'm going to have q, some number q greater than 1 particles at the bottom of the box. So let me tell you now the algorithm. I think I've said it in English, but let me just put it up here in code to say, how do you build uh, the data structure that we need for the tree? And so it's a procedure called quad tree build. It's going to call itself recursively. And um, or quad tree insert is going to call itself recursively. So I, I begin with an empty quad tree. I loop over all the particles. Capital N is the number of particles. And then I simply do an insertion. So this is sequential code. I'll talk about the parallel code later. And so at this point, what I've come up with is the way I've written this is that each leaf of the quad tree will have either zero or one particles. So whenever I take a... Let me go back to this picture. So when I get to this point, I will have created four children, and, I'll, and these guys will have four children. And then later, I have to go back and throw away the empty boxes that I created. So there's sort of a little post-processing. So, but the interesting part is, how do I do the quad tree insert? That's the recursive part. So I'm going to insert um, particle j, whose location I know, so that's basically location, into a node. And I start by trying to insert at the root. Everybody gets to try, you try to insert at the root. And if the root's full, it'll keep going down the tree. So if n is an internal node, so then what I'm going to do, that means that it still has children, I'll ask, which, children, which child do you belong in? So if I go back to this picture, I will try to insert up there. I will say, um, if I try to insert this particle, I'll say, where do you belong? Well, you belong there. And then you belong there, you belong there. And finally, I will get to a leaf. But as long as I'm somewhere in the middle, I will keep going down the tree. And so that is this particular branch. If I have a child and I belong in the child, I'll call the subroutine recursively there. And if I finally get to a leaf where there's only one, a particle, at a node in the tree that only contains one particle, that means that I'm at a leaf. And then I have to give that guy four children and insert myself into the new empty child. So it's a very simple recursive thing. Just keep going down the tree. And, it's, and here I've set it up so that I'm always going to break it up, take a, a leaf and make it four children if there's one particle in it. And it clearly, if I want to have 100 particles in it, I would just you know, have a slightly different branch there. OK. So this is a very simple sequential code. Let's ask what it costs. Because remember, our overall goal is either n or n log n. So let's ask ourselves how much this thing costs. And so we just have to understand how you do complexity in this simple recursive algorithm. And so I'm going to call the subroutine n times, n is the number of particles, and I'm going to call insert. So I'm just going to take the maximum cost of inserting one particle and multiply it by n. How, uh, so what's the cost of insertion? It's basically how many times do I call the subroutine recursively? Each level of that tree, I'm going to call it once. So if I go back to this picture, I could, uh, I could we'll call the subroutine once, twice, three times, four times at most, because the tree is of depth four. So the most expensive thing I could do is 
to uh, go the maximum depth of the quad tree for every particle. And so the question is, if I build a tree, how deep is it going to be? Now, two cases. If I have a completely uniform distribution of particles, if every leaf has an equal number, then it's going to be of depth log n, because that's you know, how deep trees are if they have order n leaves. They're log n deep, and that gives me an n log n algorithm. But I could have an arbitrary distribution of particles. I mean, what if they're all, you know, all tightly clustered together? I still want to have some assurance that I can't do it too long. And so here is a very simple argument that it can't go on forever, which is how many bits do I have in the coordinates of each particle, right? Suppose there are 32-bit numbers. So at each step of, the, of, the, of this recursion, I'm basically looking at which bit of the, each bit of the, of the coordinate tells me am I on the left or on the right. So every time I make a decision, left, right, or up, down, I'm taking the x or y coordinates and saying, what's the next bit? Is it 0 or 1? So the, I can't go any deeper. I can't ask this question any more times than I have bits in the x, y coordinates. And so uh, the total depth of the tree is at most the number of bits in the particle coordinates, you know, which is, let's say, 24 in single precision. So it'll be 24n. I mean, chan this is really a worst case scenario. But it will stop. OK. So that is how I build the data structures. And it's guaranteed n log n or n. So now we get to the interesting part, which is how I do the actual approximation. And so let me do Barnes hut first, which is I said it's going to be n log n in their initial description. So this was first published in Nature back in 86, and there have been many, many other papers since then. And as I said, it's only good for 1%. So what did I mean by that? So let me let f sub k be the force computed in particle k. And so that's a vector, a little you know, two- or three-dimensional vector. And so the metric of success is I take the approximate force, subtract it from the true force, that gives me a vector, and take its length squared and divide it by the true force and take the square root. And anyway, that's a natural metric of the, of the, and I sum that over all the particles, sum all the errors, that should be about 1%. So it's not each particle is good to 1%, it's the sum of all the errors is 1%. And for some problems, that's good enough. And so here's the high-level algorithm. And let me describe it in, in two dimensions. So I build the quad tree. That's what I already told you about. Then for each node, which means uh, for each square in, this, in the quad tree, I'm going to say, let me approximate you so when, it, when I'm far away, I don't have to look at everybody inside you. So that means that for each square in the quad tree, I'm going to compute its total mass and its center of mass. And then when I'm far enough away from it, that's all I need to know about it. And that's going to be a simple algorithm. It's called post-order traversal of a tree. And post means that I do my children first. And once I know everything about my children, I'll figure out the parent. And so it's a very simple. I touch every vertex once, and I can compute everybody's total mass and center of mass. And I'll write down the code. It's very short. So once I build that data structure, I have the ma total mass and center of mass for every square. Now, for each particle, I go through, and I traverse the quad tree, and I compute the total force in each particle. And the way I do that is I look at, at the particle, I look at all the other boxes, and I say, if you're a big box and you're far away, I'll just approximate you. And I have to, just, I have to do that for the biggest possible box, right, uh, far away. And that turns out to be a pre-order traversal over the same tree. So you, see, so you look at a parent, you look at a vertex, uh, you look at a node, you say, if, I'm f if that's far enough away, I can use your total mass and center of mass. If you're not far enough away, I'll look at the four children. And I'll ask the same question for them. Or is each child far enough away? And finally, I'll, I'll do it as soon as possible, quit as soon as possible. So here is the simple post-order traversal. And, and the idea is that starting with the leaves, I know every particle exactly. So I know everybody's mass and center of mass. And then, if I know, then I, what I say is that if I know my children's mass and center of mass, and I'm the parent, how do I get my total mass and center of mass? Well, I just add up all my children's masses. That's my total mass. And I compute the appropriately weighted average of my children's center of masses to get my own. And so I just do the children first, and I work myself up, way up the tree. And so that's, uh, in English, says everything on this code. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the mass um, with this recursive subroutine call. So I pass in a node. It's going to start by at, the, at the root. I'm going to call it for the root. And it's going to return the total mass and the center of mass of whatever node in, in the quad tree I call. So what do I do? The first thing I say, am I a leaf? Do I contain one particle? In that case, I know everything I need to know. I know one particle. I know its mass and center of mass. And that's what I return. 
Otherwise, here's the post-order traversal. I say, um, I, I'm somewhere in the middle of the tree. Let me call the same function in all four of my children, my four children being called child one, two, three, four. So I call the function recursively four times in the four children, and I get the total of mass and the center of mass in all four of my children, j equals one, two, three, four. Then I simply add up the masses of my children, add you know, the weighted sum of the center of masses of my children. So these are all little, these CMs are all little vectors. And that's my value and I pass it up to my parent. And so it's a very simple algorithm. And so how much does it cost? It's simply the number of nodes in the tree. I touch each node of the tree once. So how many nodes in the tree are there? As we said before, it's either n log n in the worst case, if it's kind of uniform, or n times the number of bits if it's, if it's a very non-uniform. Non okay, so this, this is sequential code, we, but let's understand the sequential algorithm before we do the parallel algorithm. And so now we finally get to step three where I evaluate the force on everybody. And, and I'm just gonna remind you of that metric. How do I decide if this box is far enough away that I can just use its mass and center of mass and I don't have to look at anywhere inside of it? So, uh, so here's the criterion. So for a particular particle, the Earth, here's a box in the quad tree. It's a, it's a certain distance away, it's R. So when I get to this box, I can compute that easily enough because I have the center of mass of particle and I know where the Earth is. I know how big that box is because it's in the quad tree, so I know its dimension. And so I compute this ratio. Um, where did I say it here? I compute the ratio of the size of this box divided by the distance to it, and I compare it to this user threshold that the user has given me. So theta is going to be some little number less than one. And if I choose that appropriately, then that'll tell me it's okay to go and approximate this. So I hope, I, I don't want to do all the algebra of why that's good enough, but it's pretty clear that, that if this box is very small compared to the distance away, approximating it by its center of mass is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Okay, so now let me write down the whole code for how it's going to work. And I will start just by writing down the formula on one slide, which is, you know, freshman physics. Uh, of the force between two particles due to mass. I'm going to use this formula on the next slide. So I'm going to suppose that I'm, uh, that it, that I'm allowed to use this box because this size divided by distance is smaller than the threshold. I know the center of mass coordinates. I know my coordinates. And I just do the usual inverse square law. So let, that's, I'm going to use this formula on the next slide. So here, on, again, on one slide is the recursive algorithm the pre-ordered traversal of the tree that computes all the forces. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop over all the particles in, uh, in their n particles as before, and I'm gonna call this re recursive subroutine tree force on each particle, and what are the, what are the arguments? The, argu the first argument is the particle I want to evaluate the force at, that's K. And the second argument is I want is the box that contains all the particles. So this says, please tell me the force on K due to our, all the particles in the root node. That's everybody. And then I'm going to break that up by calling it recursively. And then that'll return the force on particle K. So all the actions inside this tree force uh, subroutine, which as I said, the force on particle K due to all the particles in node N. And uh, so if there's only one particle in there, it's you know, t um, interacting two particles. It's very easy. I just use the formula on the previous slide. This is a two particle interaction. Otherwise, I ask myself, is that box small enough that I can approximate it with its center of mass? So I compute the, you know, the, dis the size and the distance, and I compute that. And if that's true, I use the formula on the previous slide. And finally, if the box is too close and too big, I need to look inside of it. So I compute the, part, the force due to all the children. I do each child separately. And I, and I ask the same questions for all the children. And there's a question. Um, how come you can't just um, get a weighted average of where all the points are and put all the total mass there and calculate the force for each particle on that, cent on that calculated center of mass? I, I think that's what the algorithm is doing. Oh, but just for every single point, though, just, or is it so, so, um, instead of just little boxes? So I, whether I'm allowed to use those little boxes, I need to make a decision about whether it's legal to approximate them by their mass and center of mass, which is that branch right there. You know, are you far, small enough and far enough away? Hmm. So which is this picture here, right? I'm, I'm allowed to use, replace this box by you know, one point only if it's 
small enough and far enough away. Otherwise, I break this into four boxes and I ask the same question about the four children. Mm -hmm. But how come it wouldn't work just to get a weighted center of mass for all the, all the points and just then you, just, the have, then you just have where? one all point. All the points in this box? Or just all the points everywhere. Well, I mean, remember, so, I well, well, I want the force on, on everybody eventually, right? I, I want to compute the, the forces on all n particles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, including particles that are right smack dab in the middle of all the others. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I can't get any useful information by averaging everybody, including the point who I care about, mm -hmm. and then using that to approximate the force okay. on the same point. Okay, yeah. I mean, everybody has to get the force on himself due to everybody else. Okay. Right, because that's how gravity works. <laughs> okay, any, any other questions here? Because, yeah, we should understand the math before I get to the, the parallelization. Yeah, so the goal is to get the force on every particle due to every other particle. Right, if I only wanted the force on one, I could probably simplify it, but that's, yeah, not so. Then I'm, that won't let me do interesting simulations. Okay. So the question is, um, how much does this cost, right? So I, I've claimed that this works, and the, uh, the correctness is very simple. The way, because of the, this, part, this simulation is I, I guarantee that every particle is accounted for, right? Because what I do, by the definition of this subroutine, please tell me the force in particle K due to everybody inside the root. And since I call it recursively on the children, every particle eventually gets accounted for. So the correctness is kind of natural. What's more interesting is the complexity. I'm claiming this is n log n. And so I have to count a little bit more carefully to convince you that it's n log n or, or order n. And um, so what I'm going to do is proof by example. I don't want to write down the general case. So, so here's how it's going to go. So what is the cost of the tree force uh, uh, called on the root? It's going to be the depth in the quad tree of the leaf containing k. That's the claim. So let me try to convince you of that. And then I will sum uh, all of these. So then what I will sum over all the particles uh, the depth, their depth in the tree. But so what I need to do to get started is, is, to sh is to convince you that if I call this subroutine on one particle, the cost is proportional to how deep it is. Okay. And I'm going to do that not for a tiny little theta, which is a little hard to understand. I'm going to pick a big theta so I can draw a picture that kind of captures the idea. And the idea is that at each level in the tree, there's only a finite amount of work to do, a bounded amount of work to do. So let's suppose my particle is sitting down here in the bottom corner. So it's really easy to see what decisions the algorithm will make. So my particle is sitting down here in this corner. And I'm, <coughs> and I'm going to let my theta, my criterion, be a little bit bigger than 1. So it'll be really easy to see which boxes the, the, the uh, tree force subroutine says you're far enough away. So these three green box, these three brown boxes in the bottom corner, they're a distance, let's say that's distance one away, and their width is one. So the ratio of D to R is one for all these three boxes. So the subroutine will say, you're far enough away. I'll just approximate you. The next level in the tree, this is distance two away, and these are all two by two boxes. So the criterion will say again, there's only a finite number of boxes at this level. And then I move up one more in the tree, these are distance four away from that corner, and they're four by four boxes, so the ratio is four over four, or one. And again, all these boxes will pass the test, and I'll approximate them. And so this very you know, heuristic argument is meant to say that the amount of work at each, uh, I'm doing a constant amount of work at each level in the tree. So this guy was at level three, so at level one, I did a constant amount of work, at level two, I did a constant amount of work, and at level three, I did a constant amount of work. And then there's level four. So at each level of k, there's a constant amount of work. So the cost is proportional to the level. And, and it's just a harder counting argument if theta is small, but it's the same idea. So now, what's the total cost? I sum over all, all the particles, and I ask, what level are you at? And that's a simple argument about trees. Just sum over it all, and it's n log n. Because the worst level is log n, so you know, this is n times log n in the worst case. And, but it strongly depends on theta, which is why people only use this for coarse approximations, you know, 1% or so. So that's all there is to Barnes-Hutt. And now I want to move on to fast multipole. But are there any questions about Barnes-Hutt? That's the, the high-level idea. So, microphone. 
So in, in the uniform case, the counting becomes easier mainly because you know pretty much the uh, dimensions of the boxes and you can essentially approximate all the way up to the right. levels. But the counting becomes a bit harder during the uh, well, non-uniform case. Well, not, not only in the non-uniform case, but if my theta were 0.01, which it might be, then I'm going to have lots of boxes at each level, and the counting just becomes more challenging. Or, but, or rather, you, you push off the counting until when theta, when theta is, or rather, when the ratio is greater than. Right. Um, and so what I didn't want to try to do was to say, how, how does the asymptotic complexity vary with theta? Because the answer is use the next algorithm instead. <laughs> we don't want to use this algorithm if we have to make theta very small. So, um, so here's sort of, so now we're going to go to the fast multiple algorithm. And, and so the big idea here is that in the Barnes hut, if I had a box, I approximated it with just two numbers. Well, one number, the center of the total mass, and then one vector, the center of mass. But I can use more numbers than that, right? I, can, I don't need to limit myself to one number and one vector. I can use more. In fact, I can just use a Taylor expansion. And in fact, if you think about it right, the mass and center of mass are just like the first two terms of a Taylor expansion. That's really all they are. And, I, and so if you just take more terms, then you can get a much more accurate approximation, and you can get as many bits as you like using a very similar idea. OK, so this. Um, uh, paper was a, uh, actually a thesis, which won uh, Best a ACM Dissertation Award, and got its uh, two authors, the, both the graduate student as advisor, into four national academies, so it was an important idea. Um, and so, as I said, the differences from Barnes-Hutt are several. So first of all, the fast multipole method, the output is not going to be the force, it's going to be the potential. And I'll remind you that all you have to do is differentiate the potential to get the force, but that's what we're going to compute. And as I said, we're going to use more information. We're going to use more terms in what turns out to be a Taylor expansion. So it's more accurate, but it can also be more expensive if you want lots and lots of di digits correct. But now we have the possibility to get you know, machine precision or whatever if we want. And it's, but the algorithm is going to become simpler in a certain way because what, I, what I'm going to be able to do is just look at the quad tree, and I will know just by the quad tree um, exactly which boxes I have to evaluate. Instead of evaluating this D over R, it's just going to be, you know, are you a first cousin twice removed kind of question in the tree? And then I'll know exactly who, who appears in the sum. Um, and so, so what's the trade-off here? Barnes-Hutt uses a fixed amount of information, which is the center of mass and the total of mass. So if you want more accuracy, you've got to increase the number of boxes. The fast multipole, you can use a fixed number of boxes and just increase the number of terms in your expansion. So it's sort of a different kind of trade-off. There are going to be two kinds of expansions I have to tell you about. Um, they're both Taylor expansions in a certain kind. The first one is called an outer expansion. That's what we saw in Barnes-Hutt. You know all the particles inside a box. I want a formula that tells me what the potential is if I'm far enough away. So an outer expansion is true outside the box. And so that's going to be one. But the final output of the algorithm is going to be an inner expansion. What I want is, is a formula that's true inside the box, that's true for all the particles inside the box, the force on them due to everybody outside. So the inner expansion is true inside due to everybody else, and the outer expansion is true outside due to everybody inside. So those are the two words I'm going to, uh, to use. So let me now rev review what the potential is, you know, which is a very similar idea to the force, but let me just re remind you of it. And so what, we're, what it's going to give you at every point for every particle is going to give you a very compact, compact expression for the potential, you know, a few terms of a Taylor expansion. It's going to give you the coefficients. And then what can you do with that? Well, you can differentiate it, evaluate it, whatever you need to do. So in three dimensions, just to remind you, what's the potential between, uh, between a particle at the origin and a particle at x, y, z? It's one over the distance. It's you know, inverse r, and there it is. And if you want the actual force, this is you know, physics one, you take the gradient, the derivative of the potential, and you get the vector over r cube. Okay? So I don't want to do the math in this lecture for the three-dimensional case because it's messy, uses spherical harmonics and stuff like that. I'm going to do it in two dimensions because I just need one variable, one complex variable to sort of write down everything so it really looks like a Taylor expansion. 
So in two dimensions, I have two coordinates. The potential is not minus 1 over r. It's the log of the distance. And when I differentiate that, take the gradient to get the force, it's you know, the inverse first power. It's not the inverse square law. It's the inverse 1 power law. And so, so I only need two coordinates. But in fact, I only need one complex number. And that's going to just make all the math fit on a couple of slides. So I'm gonna, instead of using x comma y, I'm going to use x plus i times y, where i is the square root of minus 1. And so now, what does my potential become? It is just, it's log of r, which is the log of the absolute value of my complex number. And if I remember what the uh, polar coordinates, right, so my, I write my complex number z as its norm times e to the i theta, e to the phase. And so if I just take the real part of the logarithm, that gives me log of z, and it throws away the phase, because I don't care about the phase. And so to make all the math easy on the later slides, I'm going to throw away this word real in front of everything. And it's just going to be doing, you know, basically algebra in one variable, which is z. It'll just be easier to understand what's going on. But I really only care about the real parts. And then the force looks like this. But th the beauty about the fast multiple method, and this is a fairly recent uh, um, realization, is that it works for any kind of kernel. It doesn't have to be inverse square law. It doesn't have to have any property other than it gets simpler as you get farther away which covers a lot of physical situations. And so there's this generalization, which I'll get to in the next lecture. I'll just describe it briefly, called the kernel-independent fast multiple method. And it simply assumes that you know, things get simpler as you get farther away, and it builds approximations as you go along. It doesn't build in the idea that it has to be inverse square. It just sort of you know, builds these approximations on the fly. But uh, the, the computer science structure of the algorithm is just the same. So now, let me uh, talk about the um, multipole expansion. So multipole is simply a Taylor expansion in 1 over z. Right? So I want something that's true when I'm far away. Something is true when z is large, when I'm far away from the box. And so Taylor expansions are, are you know, usually think of them as you know, when the parameter, you know, taking x, x squared, x cubed. When x get, is small, those higher powers go to 0, and then I'm going to truncate it. I'm going to truncate this too, but I'm going to truncate it when z gets large. So it's a very similar idea. And so let me just uh, write down this expansion. So here's going to be the potential at the point z due, due to a bunch of particles at zk. These are you know, complex numbers. And there is the answer. It's, it's, the, it's the mass times the log of the distance between them. So this is just the standard formula for potential. And, but I only want the real part. Uh, so if I, throw, if I take away the absolute value, I take the lo uh, log of the real part. And so now I'm going to drop the word real, as I said in the previous slide, just to make it a little bit easier. So I'm, I'm just going to compute this weighted sum, masses times the log of where I am minus the particle location. And I want to do a Taylor expansion of that, or a multipole expansion of that. So let me just take this log term and factor out a z. I'm going to write z minus zk as z times 1 minus zk over z. And that's how logarithms work, right? I can break it into two pieces. So now let me break it into these two parts. That log z is a constant. So I'm going to get the sum of the masses times log z. So that's the total mass times log z. That's the mass center of mass term from the Barnes hut. And here are all the other terms that I'm going to use to improve the approximation from Barnes hut. So it's the mass times this logarithm of 1 minus a tiny number, right? Because I'm only going to use this when z is very large, very far away compared to all the particles. So now I have to use, remember calculus, what is the Taylor expansion of log of 1 minus a tiny number? And there it is. It's the sum of zk over z to some power over e. So that's just the Taylor expansion of 1 minus a tiny number from there to there. And so let me now uh, swap the order of summation. And I'll write down the Taylor expansion for the whole thing. So there's the leading term. It's still the mass times the logarithm. And now I get a sum of, there's my z to the minus 1, z to the minus 2, z to the minus 3. So that's my Taylor expansion in, in 1 over z. And there are the coefficients that I need to compute. Those are the coefficients of the Taylor expansion. They depend on the mass. And this is the sum over all the particles. It's a finite sum. Sum over the particles is the mass of the particle times the location to the eth power all over e, where you know, e is going 1, 2, 3, 4, depending on how many terms in the Taylor expansion I want. OK, and let me just. You know, some, uh, give that thing a name, the, these, this sequence of numbers, coefficients of my Taylor expansion, that's what I'm going to store and compute in addition to the, just the mass and center of mass, which is the first term. Okay? So, so this 
is the multipole expansion. So let me now continue the algebra on the next slide. I'm just going to repeat what I said. There's the potential at point Z, which is far away. Z is large due to all the particles, Z1 through Zn. And as I said, we write it as a sum of mk times the log of the distance. And then I take out the real part, and that's all I need. And then all the algebra on the last slide got me to this point. It's the total mass times the log of where you are times uh, a Taylor expansion in 1 over z. And so that, these are called the multiple expansions. OK, so that's the repeat of the last slide. So now this is an infinite sum. I need to make an approximation. If I were doing Barnes-Hutt, I'd throw all those terms away. But since I'm not doing Barnes-Hutt, I'm going to keep some small number of them. I'm going to go up to the rth term. And r is a tuning parameter, depending on how much accuracy I want. So I'm going to keep r terms in my truncated expansion, and everything I throw away I'll call the error term, which is a function of r. And so, the, and, how, and so if I pick r larger and larger, I'll get more and more accuracy. How fast does it decrease as r increases? Well, the first term I ignore looks like this. And so every time I, I take another term, it's the largest particle uh, the farthest away particle divided by z to this power. So if this were a half, every time I increase r, I multiply by a half, and so I get one more bit, basically, every time I add a term. So I can decide easily how many terms I want. Okay, so in fact, let me just you know, expand on that last idea. How many terms do I want to keep? The error is the largest particle position divided by z to the rth power. And so let's suppose all my particles are inside this box. So z1, z2, they're all inside this little d by d box in my tree. And where is capital Z? Where, am I, where is Z that I'm going to evaluate this formula at? Remember, I want this formula to tell me the, for, the potential here far away from all the, the particles inside that box. So I'm going to insist that I'm outside the dotted line. I'm not going to try to use this formula unless this point is far enough away from that box. And so it has to be not a nearest neighbor. It can't be right in there. It has to be at least one away. It has to be at least you know, a cousin once removed in the tree. And so let's suppose this is a d by d box. And this guy is out here. How big is this error term? Well, then it depends on um, how, where this particle can be. And let's suppose he's in that corner. That's the closest he could sort of get to that guy. In that case, he's a distance d over the square root of 2. And how far away is he? He can, um, sorry, he can, let me get this right here. What, make sure I'm counting the right thing. And this guy, yes, he can be right there on the edge of the dotted line. And how far away is that? Well, that's d over 2 plus d. That's 1.5 d away. So the worst case is if z is right on the border of the dotted line and the particle is right on the border of the solid line. That'll make them as close together as possible. In that case, the ratio is still less than a half. And so that tells me that this, this quantity I'm taking to the rth power is less than a half. So every time I increase r, I'm multiplying by a half. And I get one more bit every time I do it. And so if you want 24 bits of precision, which is single precision, I've got to take 24 terms. That's worst case. You usually don't need that many. 53 terms are enough for single, for double, and so forth. And everything I've said works in higher dimensions. I didn't want to talk about it because it uses more complicated things called spherical harmonics, which are basically three-dimensional um, Taylor expansions in, in spherical coordinates. I just wanted to keep it you know, simple xy coordinates. But it all works. OK. <clears throat> so finally, this is my expansion. I've truncated it. I have the mass. I have the center of mass. And then I have, so, so I'm expanding this around the center of mass of, of that node. So there, there's, the, there's the particle that I'm evaluating it at. I'm expanding it around, excuse me, the center of the node, that little x. And so zn is the center of that little box. And there's my expansion. And I'm going to call that an outer expansion. Because it's valid when you're outside the dotted line. When you're outside the box, it's, and it's the expansion due to everybody inside that box. So I'm going to call that outer. And all I have to do is store this coordinate, you know, the, the center of the, of the box, so I know how to evaluate it, and then all the coordinates of the Taylor expansion, alpha 1 through alpha r. So that's what I'm going to be storing at every, at every vertex, instead of just the mass and center. So, and if I threw away all the alphas, I'd have Barnes-Hutt again. OK. So 
Now, what about the cost of evaluating this guy? It's obviously proportional to R. So R is a sort of a fixed amount, amount of work. And the cost is going to grow linearly with the number of bits of precision that I want. OK. So that's an outer expansion. And that's analogous to the first uh, part of the Barnes hut, where I did a post-order traversal. And at e for each vertex, I for each node in the tree, for each square, I computed the mass and, and center of mass. So this is the same idea. But now I need something else to go back and evaluate it inside each box. So what I need to do is compute an inner expansion. And that is going to be the force on every particle inside the box due to everybody outside. That's going to be, you know, give me my final answer, right? I want to know the force on everybody inside this box due to everybody elsewhere in the problem, everybody outside the dotted line. And I need to do that for every little box. So, so that will give me, so, so when I evaluate the inner expansion for that point, it'll tell me the potential there due to everybody outside, but I still have my nearest neighbors. I'm going to do those with a direct algorithm. So these guys are so close, I'm just going to use the n squared algorithm, but there are not very many particles that are my immediate nearest neighbors, and so that's OK. Remember, I'm, I'm stopping building this tree when I have at most one or two or 10 particles inside that box, so I'm going to have a limited number of immediate nearest neighbors by construction. Right, so I'm only going to use all these expansions when things are far enough away. And so what I need to do then is for, uh, for all the particles inside this box, I'm going to, so z could be any point inside this little box, I, um, and this zn is the center of it. I want to compute now an expansion. This is going to be a regular polynomial, which says what's the f potential inside the box due to everybody outside. And so I just need to compute all the coefficients of this polynomial, and I'll truncate it somewhere. OK, so finally I can give you the top, li so let's, so I'm not, I haven't built that yet, but now I've described it. So here's what the overall algorithm looks like. I build the quad tree, we've seen that before. Then I build the outer expansions everywhere. And, um, I ha and so what I'm going to do, it's going to look just like Barnes Hut. I'm going to traverse the quad tree post order from bottom to top. I'm going to take outer expansions for each child at the, at, at the leaves. And then I'll combine my children's expansions to get the parents' expansions. And when I'm done with that, I have an outer expansion for everybody in the box. Now, analogous to Barnes Hut, I start at the root. And I say, I want to compute the force due to everybody in this box due to everybody who's far enough away, my cousins once removed. And so I'm going to traverse the quad tree from the top to bottom. And I'm going to convert outer expansions of guys that are far away to inner expansions inside me. I'll draw a picture later. And I'll combine them. So, so for everybody who's far enough away, I'll take their outer expansions and convert them to inner expansions just in my box and add them up. And then finally, I do the nearest neighbors by a direct calculation. OK. So let's now uh, talk about this first part, which is how do I build the outer expansions for everybody? So as in Barnes Hut, I want to compute the outer expansion of any node. So here's a node this black box there, very cheaply if I know the outer expansions of all the children. So there's one child and there are four children. I know all of those, their expansions. I want to combine them to get my outer expansion. And remember, so what's an outer, outer expansion mean? The formula for this child is good if I'm far enough away from that child. So that means if I'm outside the blue uh, dotted line, then that formula is good. If for this child, it would be a blue dotted line that looks like this. And what I want is something that's good outside the black dotted line. That's far enough away. If I'm good outside all of these you know, four blue dotted boxes, I'm certainly, uh, and I'm outside the black dotted box, I'm outside all the blue dotted boxes. So the outer expansions here are valid outside the black dotted box. So, um, so what I need to do is take these four outer expansions of these guys, these four Taylor expansions in 1 over z, and add them up somehow and to get the expansion of the whole thing. So let me say again what I need and sort of describe the algebra. The, the final code will not be that hard, but let me just describe the algebra. So what I'm given is this expansion for my child. So z1 um, is the child. And what I want to do, and, and so z1 is the center, and I want to change it so that it's an expansion around the parent. So z2 is the parent. Let me go back here. So z1 is the center of the child. I have an expansion that's sort of centered there. 
I want to recenter it so it's centered there at Z2 instead. So I'm given this expansion centered at Z1. I want to convert it to an expansion centered at Z2. So it's like if, if these were just simple polynomials, I'd know what to do, just equate coefficients, right? It's, a, it's almost as easy. So what I want to do is pick M2 and alpha E2s so that this thing is as close as possible to this expansion. So the logarithm terms have to match. The total mass is the total mass. That doesn't change. So M2 is just M1. And each of these alpha 2s is some linear combination of these guys. So just multiply out the polynomials and equate coefficients. And so it's basically a matrix vector multiply. So I take the vector of all these R coefficients. I take the appropriate linear combinations. It's a matrix vector multiply, and I get the new coefficients. And you can pre-compute all the matrices ahead of time because everything is sort of in fixed ratios of positions, and that's all I do. So my subroutine, an outer shift, takes um, something that's centered at the child, takes the outer expansion centered at the child, does a matrix vector multiply, and gives me the coefficient centered at, at the parent. Okay. So uh, here is the code for everything I just said in English. It sort of repeats what I said. Um, I'm, it's, it's going to call itself recursively. So this is the sequential recursive code. And I'm going to call build outer of the root. Please compute something that's true when you're out for any particle uh, if you're far enough away from the root node, which is you know, so far away I don't care. But I'm going to call it on the root. And so when I call it, what I do is I ask, if you're a leaf, then um, I know what to do. I'm going to, com I com going to compute your outer expansion. And directly from its definition is a sum. And I'll pass that up to, to the parent. Okay. So otherwise, if I am uh, a, somewhere in the middle of the tree, then I'm going to do a post-order traversal. That means I say, I don't know my outer expansion. But I'm, so I'm going to ask my children each to build one. So for each four of my children, I'll call the subroutine recursively and say, please give me the outer expansion for each child. And that will come back. And then I have to add them up. But to add them up, I have to shift them all. So I have these four outer expansions at those four points. I have to shift them all so they're all centered at the origin. And then I can simply add up the coefficients. And so that's all the subroutines I just described You know, just get called there. And it's a simple recursive subroutine in its post-order traversal. Do the children, and then do myself. And so what's the cost? I'm going to visit each vertex. I'm going to do a constant amount of work at each vertex. So this expensive stuff here is done once per vertex in the tree. So it's just proportional to the number of nodes in the quad tree. And it's uh, exactly the same code as Barnes-Hutt, basically, uh, except it's a little bit more expensive because I have all this yeah, yeah, longer expansions to deal with at each vertex. OK. So now I have to take, so, so I'm finished with that. I have outer expansions for every point. And now I have to do what's really different from Barnes-Hutt. I have to combine them to get expansions inside, that are true inside each node due to everybody on the outside. And that's going to be done by traversing the quad tree from top to bottom and converting all of these outer expansions to inner expansions. OK, so here is a picture where, for how we decide which expansions to use. And so here's a parent. And the question is, I want to know, compute the force on everybody inside here due to particles that are far enough away. So what I know, because, because it's recursive, I have an outer expansion for each one of these boxes, for all of these uh, seven red boxes. And those are all valid inside the parent. Okay? So now, what about my children? I have, this parent has four children. There's one of them. I want to get a formula that's valid inside this one due to everybody who's far enough away. So these boxes are colored white because they're nearest neighbors. So an outer expansion, so an inner expansion for this guy is due to everybody far enough away. So immediate nearest neighbors don't count. So my inner expansion here is only stuff who's at least one away. And over here for this child, it's the same story. I want an inner expansion for, this, for all the potentials inside that box for particles that are far enough away. So nearest neighbors don't count. I've colored them white. I want everybody else, everybody who's either blue or red. And I need to combine all of the potential contributions from these guys to him. So the question is, who do I combine? These red ones I can use because I'm far enough away from these red ones that the one expansion for each of these red boxes is all I need to know what goes on in there. So what about my closer cousins? So everybody who's colored blue, that's called the interaction set. These guys are 
far enough away, they're at least one box of the same size away, so all of their outer expansions can be converted to my inner expansion. So at each level, I have two sets, the things that are far enough away colored red, the guys that are a little bit closer together colored blue, and for each one of these, I have to do this conversion of their outer expansion to my inner expansion. Okay? And so how many of these are there? Well, we'll count them in a moment, but you can sort of see how many there are. You know, because, well, uh, they're going to be 6 by 6, uh, except for the 9 closest one, so it's going to be 36 minus 9. No matter where I am, there's a fixed number of boxes. So unlike Barnes Hut, I don't have to sort of compute this distance divided by, you know, size divided by distance. I just look at sort of who are my cousins once removed. Okay, so what do I need to do now? Um, I need the, to be able to do the following. I need to take uh, an, an expansion that's true around this point. N2 is the parent. It's expanded around here. And I need to convert it so that it's centered at this point. So I need an inner shift. So it takes this exp an expansion here, which tells me the force, the potential, on everybody inside the black box due to everybody outside the dotted one and just shifts it so it's centered around there. And then I need to convert the outer expansion of this guy, he was a red box in the previous slide, and make him an inner expansion here. Okay. So I have these two kind of conversions to do. And again, they're just going to be turned into a matrix vector multiply, because I'm converting you know, a polynomial centered at one point to a polynomial centered at another point. So again, what am I given here? I'm given a polynomial, which is an expansion around this one, so I'm given, you know, so it's centered around Z2, the parent, and I want to just make it a polynomial expanded around Z1, expanded around the child. So I have this polynomial, which is in powers of Z minus Z2, and I wanted to make it equal to this polynomial, which is in powers of Z minus Z1, and I'm given, so I'm given these betas, and I want to solve for those betas, and so each of these is, you just multiply out the polynomials, these are all linear combinations, it's a matrix vector multiply and I can pre-compute all the coefficients, and it goes fast. So that's called an inner shift. I shift the inner expansion from the big box to the little box. The next thing I have to do is take an outer expansion for this one who's far away and make it an inner expansion for this. So the expansion here is true for as long as you're far enough away from the blue box. I want something that's only true inside the black box, so it's, sort of, it's a legitimate thing. So I'm given this expansion, for him, so it's centered at, um, let's see, I apologize, I sent it, set it backwards. I have an outer expansion for this guy, I want to convert it to an inner expansion there. Excuse me. So I have something that's true outside the black dotted line, so it's certainly true inside the blue box. And so I'm, so I'm given Z3, I'm given the mass of everything inside there, and I'm given the coefficients alpha, that's an expansion that's true everywhere outside the black dotted line, and I want to convert it to something that's the same inside the blue box. So I want, and the blue box is centered at Z4, so, I, so Z4 is given, I want to compute the betas. I want to compute the polynomial that's true inside there. So again, I have these two things. I want to you know, pick the betas to make it as equal as possible, and again, everything over here is just a linear combination of all those coefficients. It's another matrix vector multiply. So, and I can pre-compute all the coefficients. Sorry, I got the algebra backwards. There's a lot of notation here. Okay, so back to this picture, just to say it again. So I want the inner expansion. I want something that tells me the force inside that box due to everybody who's far enough away. That's everybody except the nearest neighbors, everybody except who's colored white. So I will take all of the outer expansions of the red guys, convert them from outer to inner, so it works in there, and do the same thing for these uh, blue guys. Make them outer to his inner. And so now I have an inner expansion for n. OK. So now I will do the counting. How much did that cost? Well, um, this, there's only a, a, a small number of these guys, because they're far, they're far away. And so I just need to ca count the interaction set. And if I look at this box, it's 6 by 6. So there's 36 vertices there. I'm not going to do the nine nearest neighbors, so there's 36 minus 9 or 27. So that's the cost to do that. And in three dimensions, this would be a 6 by 6 by 6 cube of little boxes, and I would be leaving out the 3 by 3 by 3 box of little neighbors, so it's still only a finite number. There are only 189 neighbors I have to do this for. It's still possible. 
And so here is a picture, and I've just sort of described both pictorially and in the, in the graph, who am I going to do the interactions with? Okay, so finally, all of that English fits in one you know, half slide of code. So here is all of the code that's needed sequentially to build the inter interactions, build the inter uh, uh, expansions. So I will call it on the root and say, please build me an expansion that tells me everything inside the root due to everybody outside. There's nobody outside the root, so that's sort of, but I, I, the base of the induction starts there. And it's going to return all the coefficients of my polynomial in the center, which is the center of the, of the root node. So, um, so I, what I do is I ask, who's my parent? And I take all of the, um, and, and so then what I do is I take the inner expansion of my parent and convert that to my inner expansion. That gets all the red guys. And then I do all of my interaction set for everybody who's colored blue. I take their outer expansion, convert it to an inner expansion, add it to mine. Okay? And then that's so, it's, so there's a constant amount of work per vertex, even though there are a lot of vertices. And so it's order n, the number of nodes in the quadtree. So those are the, that is by far the most complicated part of the algorithm. But it sort of is, you know, in spirit similar to Barnes Hut. And the last step is I've done everybody except my immediate neighbors do them with a direct algorithm. Just use the direct n squared algorithm where for everybody, if this were the bottom, if this were a leaf, then I would be done. I'd, but I still haven't done all of my eight nearest neighbors. I do them with a direct n squared algorithm. And that is, again, just uh, order n in cost. Because at that point, there's just not very many uh, particles left in each vertex because that's at, at each leaf because I've designed it that way. There's a constant number of... of nodes in each leaf. Okay. So um, at this point, I would talk about parallelizing it. So we could also say that's enough for one day and, and sort of uh, go on to the parallelization next time, because otherwise I'd have to stop in the middle of the parallelization and uh, continue. So maybe um, I'll stop here.